All right. Before the break, we did cover the common emitter stage in more details, especially when we saw what happens when you have resistances in the emitter. So that's one stage, which basically has an input at the base and the output taken out of the collector. Now, but that's not the only thing you can make, right? I mean, you can think about taking the input, uh, you know, taking the output from other places or applying your input to other places. The transistor has three terminals. So there are different topologies, and each one of them has its own property. So the next one we are going to talk about is basically the common collector, or also known as emitter follower. So what at that, that stage is, essentially, is where it, you have a voltage applied, still your input is applied to the base, but this time, instead of taking your output from the collector, you're taking it from the emitter. So even looking at it, before we start analyzing it, let's see what we can expect to see in something like that. What, what do we expect to get from understanding of our input and output resistances, right? So the input resistance of the stage, what do you expect it to be, roughly? And I want, I encourage you to start thinking about it without having to write equations, because this would be a helpful way of dealing with these as, as they grow. So we have to develop some intuition about it. So the input resistance, if you have a stage like this, Rn, you remember we just talked about, before the break, we talked about the common emitter, right? With degeneration. Is the input behavior different fundamentally from the input behavior of the common emitter? Right? No. You can use it, you can use the reflection rule. We talked about the reflection rule. We saw that if you have some resistance in the emitter, whatever you have in the emitter can be viewed from the base side if you multiply it by beta plus one, or roughly beta. So what do we have? What do we have in the emitter? What is, what is the total resistance in the emitter right now? You have, of course, the RE, and then you have this RM, alpha RM, sitting here, which is implicit inside the transistor. So there's a little alpha RM here on the emitter side plus RE. So if you multiply by beta plus one, you will get exactly the same result as common emitter. So you should have the R pi from this one and beta times RE, beta plus one times RE. So you can see that your input resistance is still can be quite large if you have a sufficiently large RM or, or, or R, R pi or RE, right? Because it gets multiplied by beta. So you have an input, res input resistance that's large, which means that it's a good voltmeter. Okay? Now, but the key, the, the key question, so that part is kind of like the more obvious one. The key question is, what is the output resistance? And the reason I'm talking about this goes back to what kind of use does this stage have? How do we use it? And we'll see also the comment, you know, when we talk about the uh, source follower, which is the MOS counterpart of this. So what is the output resistance when you look into this thing? Remember, we had the resistors looking down is obviously RE. Right? So that R out can be written into two parts. This part, which is RE, and this part looking up, which is what? What do you see? If I null my independent source the way I've drawn it. My independent source is Vn, right? If I null it, this is going to be AC ground, this is going to be AC ground. We talked about what are the three impedances that you see into the looking into the terminals of the resist transistor, right? What do you see, roughly, looking into the emitter? Rm. Right? Alpha RM, RM. So you see RM in parallel with RE. So the output resistance is going to be on the order of RM. Is it good or bad? Is it large or small? small. It's small. So you have a source whose input resistance is small. What kind of a source is it? Is it more like a voltage source or a current source? Voltage source, right? A small source resistance looks like a voltage source, right? A voltage source with a small, a large source resistance corresponds to a current source. See, we have to get used to these kind of notations. So it is a good voltmeter and a good voltage source. So it sounds like a good voltage amplifier if it had gain, which it doesn't. But, but still, it's useful for something. So let's, let's look at it. Let's, let's, see, let's try to understand it. So let's say you are 
Let's start with the basic T model, alpha Rm, Re. Now, it's almost trivial to calculate the gain of this thing. Um, so this is I, alpha Ie, this is Ie, this is V in, and this is V out. Can you see what V out to V in ratio is? What determines that? This voltage is V in. What is this voltage? Yeah, it's a voltage divider, right? Re divided by the parallel copy, the, the sum of the two resistances. So this is how you can see how T model makes it really simple. Because now the gain is Re divided by Re plus alpha Rm. That's the gain. And you can see it's less than 1. If Re is large, much larger than Rm, it can become 1 close approach asymptotically to one. So you have a stage that has a, and we can calculate the other parameters more accurately, precisely in a second. But you have a stage whose input resistance is large, whose output resistance is small, and whose gain can be close to one. You can say, what use is a stage with a gain less than one or one? A wire is better. I can use a wire. Why do I need to use this? Burn current and spend money on a transistor. Well, it does something. It takes, it presents a lot large input resistance, and it can drive. Well, so it's a good driver. It doesn't get you gain, but it can provide current because it has really current gain if you think about it. You put a little bit of current into it, you get a lot. Basically, you get one plus beta times more current because you get it out of the emitter. So it's a buffer. It's a good buffer or a driver. It doesn't give you the gain, but it can drive small loads, for example, for you. You remember, we said something, and we'll see this more and more as we go. If you're trying to get gain, you need high impedance. Right? If you're trying to increase your gain, you need high impedance nodes. Now, if you have high impedance nodes, those nodes are very high gain, but they're very fragile. If you load them with anything, if you try to drive anything with them, so let's say you work hard and you make a node that has one mega ohm of resistance for the sake of argument, right? And then you have a driver and you get, oh, I'm getting a lot of gain. I have a GM of one milli Siemens, I'm driving a one mega ohm, or let's say 40 milli Siemens, I'm driving a one mega ohm, ohm. I have 40,000, gain of 40,000 out of that. Great. But as soon as you connect a resistor, it doesn't even have to be a small resistor, it's like you connect a kilo ohm resistor to that. Well, you have a mega ohm in parallel with a kilo ohm, it's a kilo ohm. So now your gain, instead of being 40,000, is 40. If you attach a 100 ohm, it's going to be 4. If you attach a 50 ohm, it's going to be whatever, times go on, 2, and so on and so forth, right? So they are like some individuals. Some individuals have a very high gain, but they're very fragile. You have to put them in the right operation points and like they have to have the right environment, everything for them. But then they are high gain, they can produce a lot. Some, some, some of them are very resilient. They may not have a lot of gain, but they can carry, handle anything. So this guy is a tough guy. <laughs> right? So it is good to protect. These are like the, I don't know, the, in the football, if you think about them, the line minerals, the people who are standing in front of the quarterback, right? It's protective uh, from pressure. So, so this is, these guys basically, you can see them appearing before and after your gain stages. Right? So they protect them. So, okay, so let's do a little bit more calculations. So, so let's see. This is, this is the gain. Fine. What is the input resistance? Well, the input resistance is what we just said. I mean, it's, you can use the reflection rule. We talked about the reflection rule. It's whatever we had in the emitter multiplied by beta plus 1. So you have alpha Rm times beta plus 1, which gives you R pi. And then you have 1 plus beta or beta plus 1 Re. So roughly R pi plus beta Re. So that's the input resistance. It can be large because of this. Now, how about the output resistance? Well, we kind of argued what it is, but let's calculate it exactly. So now, let's make it even a little bit more elaborate. So let's say I even have a base resistance, Rb. So if you have a base resistance and this is your Vn, right?
Now, you are grounding this, of course. You're trying to calculate the output resistance. So your output resistance is going to be the parallel combination of what you see this way and that way. We talked about that. Looking down, you see RE, obviously. What do you see looking up? Again, reflection rule. I'm taking something in the base and moving into the emitter. What does it get multiplied by or divided by? Beta. Divided by beta, beta. Good, good, good way of thinking. It's beta plus one, but beta is good. I like thinking about it as beta. So it gets divided by beta. So you have, F, you have Rm plus whatever this Rb is divided by beta. If you want to write it, if, you're, if it bothers you, you can say R out is the parallel combination of Re and alpha Rm plus um, Rb over 1 plus beta. Or better, Re parallel Rm plus Rb over beta. So we won't be bothered. Actually, we would be encourage you if you make these kind of simplifications. That's fine. Remember, there are cases where you subtract something from something else. If you're subtracting an RE from one alpha RE, then you have to take this into account. But other than that, a lot of times, basically, it's just this stuff. Now, and simplifications are good. So and how about the gain? Would the gain change if you have an RB? Yeah, it does change. What you can do, you can take the RB and move it into the emitter. And then you will have a divider between three resistors. So instead of this, then it becomes Rb over beta plus 1, or beta. Does it make sense? If you had a base resistance, then that also moves into the emitter. So you have two resistors here. You have Rb divided by beta plus 1, and R alpha Rm, and then you have Re. So you have a resistive divider between those three resistors, which is the same thing. That gives you that value. So that's the gate. So high input impedance, low output impedance, and a close to unity gain, properly designed. So this is from a small signal. From a large signal perspective, also, it should make sense, right? I mean, what does it look like from a large signal perspective? If you look at the large signal, so this is capital V in, V out characteristic. Well, as I, if I'm at 0, there's very little current. As I increase it, slightly my current will increase, right? But what would happen? What is the voltage VBE across here? The VBE is going to be VT, KT over Q, natural log of IC over IS, right? That's the inverse of the exponential, which you can write as VT natural log of RE I. You can say Re alpha, oh, oops, sorry. Um, you can say Re times, I'm sorry, I'm messing, making it up. So Ic is basically alpha Ie. And Ie is basically V out over Re. Is. So this is the voltage drop across the base emitter in large signal. OK? So this is the base emitter voltage. Now look at this. As V out increases, this voltage does increase a little bit, but slowly, because it's a logarithm. It's inside the log. So what happens is that V in, V out, it kind of looks like this. So if this is V out equals V in, that so this is a slope of 1. So it starts growing a little bit slowly, kind of like just, and then it basically drops. But so there's a little bit of a drop, so this is like a 0 0.6, 0 0.7. But essentially, this guy tracks that guy with a 0.7 volt drop, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volt, whatever the drop VBE is for a silicon transistor at milliamps of current. You're looking at 0.7. If you have a germanium transistor, that voltage would be because I is smaller. Uh, is you will have a uh, 0.5. And then if you had a other kind of like some of the HPT, silicon germanium, or some of the other combination of transistors may have a different voltage. Anyway, but that's what it is. So you can, you can see it. And now what if I said, OK, this is really horrible. I don't really want to deal with this variation of the voltage because I want the output to be a perfect replica of the input. How would I do that? How would I deal with that? How would I get, can you think of a way of getting rid of this weak dependence? So you can see it's not perfectly linear, right? V in, V out. So this is really 
the V in, V out is this guy, the solid one. Can you think of a way of making this, from a large signal perspective, not depend on this voltage? What, where does this dependent come from? Where does this change come from? Something changes that results in the change in this voltage. What is that? It's this guy, right? The collector current is changing. As I increase the input, right, this voltage goes up, there's more current going through the RE. So the collector current is changing, and as a result, the emitter current is changing, so the collector current is changing, so my VB is changing. Albeit slowly because it's through a log, but it changes. So how can I avoid this change? Can you propose a solution? Yes? Increasing RE is one solution, but then it means that you will have less current driving. So that's one way. But, but it's in the right direction. You're thinking in the right direction. So I think there was a hand raise. That happened like half a second before you. So, so OK. Like having a current source of the bias. OK. What's your suggestion? OK, so two solutions. I mean, three solutions, really. R, make RE larger. The other solution was to make the, put the current source here. If you could put an ideal current source, then that forces the current to be constant. And then the third solution was to offer a parallel branch to take some of the current away actively, which can also happen. So it can actively steer current away. All three of these solutions can work. They're actually in exactly progressively more level of complexity in the order they were other. All three of them are good ideas. Okay? So, okay, but if you, for example, put a current source here, what we can do is that instead of having this stage, we can have a stage like this, and that, would, that stage would maintain a constant VB as long as there's no current going to the output, to the load, right? Because there's a V in and there's a V out, and there's an I bias, and that I bias will maintain this voltage as constant. So it's a good buffer. It can provide isolation between different stages. It can protect your high impedance nodes, right? And it's, a, it's an interesting stage, and we'll use it. OK, any questions on the common emitter? And you can see that it's really T model makes it trivial. It's a voltage divider. It's a resistive voltage divider. How about another stage? So where else can we apply an input and measure an output? Well, we applied, remember, it's the voltage across the base emitter, the base emitter fluctuations that induce the collector current changes that are producing the changes that we are interested in. Now, we can also get this induced, so, so we, what we did in the common emitter, we applied the input to the base and produced a VBE that produced the changes in the collector current. Now, instead, we can apply, so instead of changing the base to produce a change in VBE, we can also change the emitter, right? And if you do that, it means that you're applying an input to the emitter and you're taking your output from the collector. So that's what we call a common base. And the common base stage essentially looks like this. So you have the collector, VCC, RC. And then you have now this time you keep, instead of keeping the emitter at a constant voltage, you keep the base at a constant. And we show it like this, VB, or V bias sometimes. When we show this, really what we mean is that there's a battery here from our perspective. It's a fixed voltage we maintain. Then we'll talk about how to generate these voltages. We haven't talked about biasing yet extensively. Um, we'll talk about that. So there's some bias that generates it. And then you're applying your input, let's say, let's say initially as a voltage source, but we'll talk about that here. So when you have something like this, let's say before we actually write equations, what do you expect the gain of this stage to be? Well, let's think about the input and output resistances as well first. What is the input resistance of this stage? Meaning the resistance that the source sees. So looking into here, what do you expect it to be roughly? Alpha Rm, right? Rm-ish, like in the order of Rm, right? Alpha Rm, that's correct. So you see some Rm or alpha Rm looking into here. 
What do you expect the output resistance to be? Well, it really depends on what you have, what kind of source you have. If you had an ideal voltage source like this, when you're trying to calculate that, you need to null this, which basically means that you short it. Then what do you see? You see RO. Now, depending on what kind of source you have, this may be RO or maybe different. At least, but it's at least RO. Now, what do you think the fluctuations would induce? What kind of a transconductance do you expect to see? Again, we will write this in equations, but before we do that, we need to kind of like understand what it does. So you're changing VBE, right? So instead of changing it from here, I'm changing it from here, from this terminal, right? Before, I kept this constant when we had the common emitter. I fluctuated this to produce the voltage change. Now I'm keeping this constant. I'm fluctuating this. So I expect the gain to be, how do you expect it to be related to the gain of a common emitter without the generation? Should be similar, right? Except for one little difference. What's that little difference? Non yeah, it's not inverting now because remember, you have, I've changed the polarity of my input. Now, when this was going up, now this is going up, which basically means that the tip, I'm applying the voltage in the other. So I expect this to be a non inverting stage as opposed to an inverting gain stage. And if you do that, I mean, you can easily see. So you can look, think about it also from a large signal perspective, what you get from V in, V out characteristic. So if my V in is, let's start from very high. Let's start from, if my V in is very high, above V bias, let's say, is this transistor on? No, because this VBE is reverse bias. The base emitter is reverse bias, right? So the transistor will be off. What would be my collector voltage? It would be VCC. So at some point, I start lowering this VN, and then at some point, it starts turning on. As it turns on, it starts drawing current, it starts pulling this node now. And at some point, it hits this v, determined by this V bias, it will stop. So this will be the exponential, and then it will not go on forever. And where this happens depends on when this V bias is, where this junction becomes forward bias. When this, vol at what voltage. Um, okay. So, so that's the big picture general view of it. We can also do the uh, calculations of the gain from a small signal perspective, and let's do that. So let's say that you have a, so initially, if you just look at it this way, let's draw the small signal model. And again, since the emitter is not connected directly to ground, let's use the T model. And for now, we are ignoring RO. We'll come back to it. So this is, this is ground, and this is VN, right? So what do you see? You are applying a VN. What is IE in terms of VN? Well, this side is grounded, right? My ground become progressively like a circle. Uh, but, uh, okay, what is, v what is the volt? The IE is trivial, right? IE is negative Vn over alpha Rm. It's this voltage across this guy. And then, now, alpha IE is alpha times that, and that's the current that comes out of the RC. So this is V out. So V out is going to be, and the current is coming out. So it's negative RC times IE, which would be the minus signs cancel. So you get V in and the, there's an alpha here, sorry, alpha E. The alphas cancel, you get RC over RM, or GM RC times V in. Therefore, AV, which is by definition V out over V in, is GM RC. So this should not be very surprising. It's non-inverting, so the minus sign is not there, unlike the common emitter. It's essentially the same gain if you are ignoring the RO business and all those things. Because you're just changing the polarity of the input. But now this stage behaves somewhat differently, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, its output resistance is what? Is RC parallel with whatever this is? So it can be made large if you make RC large. So you can actually get high gain out of it if you need to. Um, if you make, for example, the RC large, and we'll do that in a few minutes. 
And then, but how about its input impedance? Its input impedance, and we'll talk about out, its output impedance quantitatively in a minute, but its input impedance, what is it? Is it small, large? Small. It's small. It's smaller of the three resistors, right? It's RM. So what kind of a meter is it? Is it a voltmeter or a good, is it a good voltmeter or is it a good ammeter? It's a good ammeter, right? Because it has a low resistance. So it's good at measuring current. So if you have a source that has a high source impedance, which basically means that it's like more of a current source, this would be a good thing to deal with that. And it, has, it can have high output resistance, which basically means that it can provide gain. So what is the output resistance? Well, let's find out. Well, we've already found out. So all we need to do is just say, look, put the RO back in. And now let's assume that generally you have some source resistance. Because if it's driven, for example, instead of like this, by a current source. We said it's good for driving with the current source. So this is I in and some RS, our source, source resistance. Or it can be also RE. Um, so now in the small signal model, you have the RS here, and then you have the RO here. But this circuit we have already analyzed, this network. Because if you think about it this way, the resistance looking down here, when you're looking at that, and when you're nulling the independent source, what does this look like? This is exactly common emitter with emitter degeneration, except for that RE is now called RS. So the maximum output resistance that this can have is what? If RS was large. You remember, for the common emitter, we did calculate this. And the output resistance, so R out prime, the intrinsic part, is RO times 1 plus, or, or RM plus RE over alpha, or RS now, over alpha, RM. And we did this calculation uh, before the break over beta. So the maximum R out prime max is beta RO. But if that's the maximum output resistance it can get, what is the maximum intrinsic gain? What is the maximum gain that this stage can achieve? Because remember, the gain of the stage is generally now, basically, this is going to be RC in parallel with R out prime when you take that into account. So that's a parallel comp. That's a total resistance on the output to ground, if you know all the independent sources. The total resistance on the output would be the intrinsic one, which is the R out prime looking down in parallel with RC. Now, if you set RC to be very large, you're limited by R out prime. So it's going to be GM times that. But R out prime can be as large as what? Beta RO. So if you look at this maximum intrinsic gain, is now beta GM, GM, beta GMRO, which was beta VA over VT. You remember for, what was, do you remember what it was for common emitter? It was VA over VT, or GMRO. It didn't have the beta. This is actually a useful feature, a very useful feature in fact, that it says that the output resistance of this, the maximum intrinsic gain of this stage is beta times larger. If you drive it with the right source, what is the right source? The right source is something that looks like a current source and has a large output resistance. Can you think of a terminal of the transistor that acts like a current source and has a high output resistance? Of the three terminals of the transistor, which one looks like a current source and has a high impedance looking into it? Remember what we saw, RM, RPi, RO for emitter, base, and collector. And what do you see when you look at the collector? RO, and a current source, right? That current source. So what does it tell you about a good thing to drive the stage with? 
collector of another transistor. Exactly. So if we take this stage, our common base, and drive it with another transistor with a collector of another transistor, it seems that we should be able to achieve at least high output impedance, which can help us achieve high intrinsic gain. So what is that? Well, let's see. What are the impedances? What is the impedance looking? Well, what's the input impedance here? Let's start simple. What do we see looking into the base? R pi, right? What do you see looking down here? So this is now your source, driving the common base. What do you see looking down here? Looking into the collector of a transistor, what do we see? RO, right? Remember, RM, R pi, RO. So you see RO. Now, this is your drive. Now, and, and then this RO, the current that comes out of this stage, is divided between RO and the input, current, input resistance of the next stage, which is what? Alpha RM, RM. So all of the current goes really into the emitter. Because you have a like, 25 ohm in parallel with 100 kilo ohm. Where does the current go? Goes into 25 ohm. And then that current gets reflected all the way here with a factor of alpha. So we can actually do small signal analysis. And again, this is something that we need to kind of get used to. I'll try to do it from time to time, uh, more and more as we go, on the circuit diagram. So what we are going to be doing is say, say, OK, well, there's a V in here. This is the small signal V in. Okay? What current does it generate here? Do you agree that it's going to be GMV in? That's the current source. Think about the pi model. Now, GMVN is going to be going into these two, divided between these two resistors, but for all intents and purposes, it's going all straight into the emitter. Because that resistor is significantly larger, orders of magnitude larger. So this current is going to be what? Alpha GMVN, right? Because there's an alpha ratio from the emitter to the collector. So that's the current that's being pulled out of this node. Now, how much voltage does that generate is negative of that current times the total resistance that you see from that node to ground when you null all the independent sources, right? There's some, if you null every independent source, so there's nothing driving it, you look at that node, you see some resistance to ground. And it comes from different sources. Where does it come from? There is an RC, obviously, up here. And there's something looking down here. So what is this, what we call R out prime, the intrinsic resistance? What is that? What is that value? Well, let, let's think about it. So here, what is my new RS in the calculation we ran? If I have this, so this is my common base, right? I have a, what is the resistance looking into here? RO. So RS is RO. So if I make that RO, obviously RO is pretty large compared to RM. Even RO divided by beta is going to be much larger than RM most likely. right? So this is going to be beta RO. So looking down into here, I see beta RO. So the gain of the stage from this calculation, you can see it's going to be negative alpha gm times rc in parallel with beta ro. Does that make sense? And if I ask you what is the output resistance of this thing, we already know it, right? It's r out from beta ro parallel with rc. It's this guy. It's really GM times the output resistance. You can write it like this. Write this GM RC parallel beta RO, which is the output resistance. And there's a factor of alpha. Because of that second transistor taxing a little bit of the current. Okay? 
So my question to you is, what did this do? Is it good, bad, what, what's happening now with this stage? Do we have a decent stage now? Well, from, for voltage amplification. What is the problem with common base if you wanted to use it as a voltage amplifier? What was the common with, problem with the common base? That it's small input resistance, right? Exactly. So it's not a good voltmeter. It's a good ammeter, but it's not a good voltmeter. So what we did, we made that better by a factor of beta. We made it into our pi. So you got a beta times higher input resistance. So it's beta times better. Or beta times less bad. But then we also got a gain, but we got also something else. We got the good part of the common base from the gain perspective, which is that you have now higher output resistance. So if I can make my RC large, then this is going to be my intrinsic gain for this stage with a decent input impedance. This stage has a name. It's called cascode. Now, where does that name come from? So it's cascode. Not cascade, cascode. And it's the short for cascaded cathode. Now that should give you a sense of where it comes from. So you're now probably familiar but by, with vacuum tube diode and triode, right? But now the problem they had, I mean, this, ha this stage has another advantage that's even more important than this which we'll talk about when we talk about high frequency behavior. This stage has a really good frequency behavior for reasons we'll discuss in detail later. But what they saw is that they had a cathode and they had a grid, right? And they had the, the, so they had the anode cathode and the grid. And what they saw is that essentially, if they introduced a second cathode, I would say second, second um, grid, and connected to a fixed potential, let me just show it this way connected to some fixed potential. And then when they connected this to some resistors to some supply, and this was ground, and the input that was applied here, if they had a second grid, what they call it a cascaded cathode, it performed a lot better, both in terms of gain and frequency response, which we haven't, the second part we haven't talked about. And they call it cascaded cathode. This K, what do you think they call this kind of vacuum tube that had four terminals? The three terminal was, one was called triode, tetrode. And then they eventually realized that some of these hot electrons that hit here kind of reflect back and go into this guy. And there's a current in there that's going to cause problem and it creates modulation. So they introduced the fixed, a, a third one. Uh, and that was called the pentode. And pentode was a vacuum tap tube that was very popular. A lot of these, like big, like 100 years ago or something like that, a lot of these rad big radios, like the old one that you see in the movies and all those things that had a like pentode. And pentode radio was really a big deal at the time because they could actually get good performance and high, pre high frequency behavior so they could actually get the radio signals amplified and things of that sort. So, Again, the word cascode comes from cascaded cathode, which is basically the basis for that. So, so that's, that's the name for that. That's why it, where it comes from. But so now we have this stage, but then the question is, can we make gain? How do we get more gain? So let's say we want to make some amplification stages that have gain. We said, OK, let's make something that we, we talked about this before. right? We said, we have to make RC larger. We can't just make RC larger by itself, because if you do that, then the current goes to 0. As soon as you start drawing current, the voltage goes all the way down. Right? Let's say you make your RC 100 mega ohm. You put a 100 mega ohm resistor there, well, as if the 100 mega ohm will act as a 100 mega ohm because the leakage current through the surface of the something and all those things probably make it less than 100 mega ohm. But let's say you had a 100 mega ohm resistor that you could put in there. What happens? As soon as you touch this, start increasing it, this just boom, jumps down. So there would be no drive capability. Yes, it will have a very sharp transition, which means that it has high gain, but you cannot connect anything to it. It can't drive anything. So ideally, and we talked about this when we were talking about a load line, you don't want a load line that looks like a line. You want a load line, well, a, a slanted line. You want a load line that's flat, which basically means that you have a current source. So ideally, you want to get this maximum gain, you need to have a current source here. 
So let's go back to our basic state and start from that, and then we'll come back to this. So let's say we start with a common emitter and say, I want to make this high gain. So I'm going to put a current source here. I say, great, V in, V out. And we know what the maximum intrinsic gain of this guy is, right? What's the maximum intrinsic gain? If you had an ideal current source here, it would be GM, or what would be the would be negative, GM um, RO, right? Which would be VA over VT. And you say, okay, great, I have solved the problem. I can get VA over VT. You go to the stock room, you pick a transistor, and then you go through the drawers looking for a current source. So where is the, these are the voltage, the batteries, where are the current sources? All right. And you don't find one. First of all, the current sources would be hard to keep, right? Because if you keep them open loop, there would be an arc across them. Let's say one amp current source brought it in, there would be a beautiful arc around it because the current has to, forces a one amp current through the air, right? And if you keep them short, they will dissipate energy and they will run out pretty quickly. So what, what, what are, how do we get this? So are we done? No. What, is, what do we mean by a current source? What is a current source? Or what's a good approximation of a current source? It's something that has what kind of output impedance? Low or a source impedance, let's say. Low or high? High, right? Because an ideal current source, when you null it, should be an open loop. So it should look an like an infinite loop. So it's something with a high output impedance. But we do have things like with high output impedance. We have a terminal in the transistor that presents high impedance, which is, which, which one of the three? The collector, right? exactly, right? So I need to put a collector here. So how do I put a collector here? So does this work? Well, that may work actually, but just so. Um, but let's say, can I just do this without any fancy things? I don't know, maybe. But I still need a current source because this current is going this way, this current is going this way. So I can't take this out and put another collector here. Because both of them need a current. And then if I need to put a current source there, I already had the current source to begin with. So I need to do that. So how do I do that? How do I make a current? I need a current source. This transistor is a good current source, but it can only sink current. And I'm using some of these terminologies are common terminology. It can only sink current, meaning that it can only draw DC current DC current can go into the collector. You need something that provides DC current coming out of the collector. Do we have that? It's a PMP transistor, right? So if you put a PMP transistor, that's why you put a PMP, and it, whose collector is connected here, and you keep it at some V bias, then this can actually source current. So the PMP collector sources current, and the NPN collector sinks current. That's common terminology. So now you can actually have a situation where this provides some I bias, which goes into, so this is IC1, whatever IC and IC, they're going through here. So what is the gain of this stage? What is the gain? Again, let's do small signal on the thing. And if you are in doubt, always draw the small signal model, and you'll see it. So you have a V in here. So what you see, the drive current here is going to be GMV in. It's going to be pulled out of this node. What is it going to be pulled out of? The small signal impedance, the total small signal impedance that's on that node, which is what? RO of what? So, it's, so looking down, what do we see? We see RO, let's say, N, for the NPN transistor. But you also see a resistance looking up. To where? To ground, because VCC is ground from an AC perspective. So looking up. You also see a resistance, like right? you're looking into another collector. What do you see looking into the collector? RO. So this is ROP, whatever the RO of the PMP is. So the total gain of this stage is going to be GM RON parallel ROP. So that is the gain of this stage. So you can also express this in terms of VAs, right? And, and G, so you can, write it as, you can write it as IC over VT, and then this becomes VAN 
over IC times VAP over IC divided by VAN over IC plus VAP over IC. And then what all the ICs cancel, so you end up with negative VAN, VAP. So these are the early voltages of the NPN and PNP, VT, VAN plus VAP. So, I mean, VAP, the, the PMPs usually have slightly lower early voltage, but let's say well, for the sake of argument, they are the same. So this is going to be 100 times 100, it's 100 divided by 200, so that's going to be 50 divided by 25 millivolts, so that's 2,000. 1,000, I mean, if it's 100. I mean, it can be 1,000, it can be 500, depending on what the values of these things are. Right? So that's the maximum gain you can get out of the stage. But is that the limit? Can we do better? Let's say we want to get even more gain out of one stage. And you may come back and say, wait a second, you have one of these. Why don't you put another one right after it, cascade them, not cascode, cascade them, put them in series, and you will get the product of the two gains. If you add 1,000 here, you get another 1,000 there, you get a million. What's your problem? You will see, and we will see, we haven't seen it, that from stability perspective, it's better to get as much gain in as few stages as possible when we talk about high frequency behavior. And some of this will happen later this quarter and some of it will happen next quarter. But we'll, have, we'll see that. Um, but essentially, let's say that we want to get more gain from the same stage, through the same stage. Is there a way to make this higher gain? Can you think of a way of making this stage? In one stage, you can get more gain. One stage meaning that, that they are sharing the same current. Yes. Oh, OK, so, so he says, wait a second. This guy, replace it with a cascode. You get more output resistance. And that's a good suggestion. We'll make this a cascode. So this becomes a V bias, VB1. And then this becomes V in. And now what do we have? Well, now look here. Look, I, I want everyone to pay attention. This is RON, right? What is this going to become? You did that. Beta RON, right? Now, that's beta RON. So now what are we going to get? So what, how is my gain going to change? So now this is going to become beta RON. Remember, this was, let's say, if we said it's 100 kilo ohm and whatever. Before it was 100 kilo ohm, and now, and let's say this was 100 kilo ohm. It wouldn't be, let's say, 50 kilo ohm, but let's say 100 kilo ohm, 100 kilo ohm. But now this becomes 100 kilo ohms times 100. So it's 10 mega ohms. So now you have 10 mega ohms parallel with 100 kilo ohms. So what is the dominating parameter now that's limiting your gain? ROP, exactly, right? So now this is becoming, this doesn't matter. This has become so large, it doesn't matter now. So now this is basically, and how much improvement did we get really in this example? We got a factor of two, right? Because our output resistance went from 50K to 100K, effectively. So, it didn't give us that much, but can we do something about that? Can you think of something? Cascode the PMP. Make that also a cascode and have a, another V bias, VB3. And now what you see is that now looking up here, you see ROP, and then now here you see beta. This is really beta N and this is beta P because they're different. Um, and the RON and ROP are different. But so you see that. So what you have is beta n times that, and then here you get beta p times ROP. So let's assume that they are all the same, which they are not. It would be now 100. So now you have 10 mega ohm in parallel with 10 mega ohm, so you have 5 mega ohm. So then if you have a transconductance of 40 millisiemens, you're talking about 40 milli times 10 mega, so you have 400,000 of gain. I mean, that's, those are pretty high numbers. I mean, actually, practically, this is going to be more like 30. This is going to be more like 30. This may not be as high. So if you're, you may be limited by this, so you may get a tenth of that, 5,000 maybe. But this is the game. So you said, OK, it worked once. It worked twice. Can I do more? 
What happens if I put another layer of cascade, cascode here? If I make this a triple cascode? So if I put this here, and this is your VN. So this is on V bias. And then do the same thing here. Say, well, yeah, the top one will dominate, sure. Would this, what would the gain of this be? And there's an alpha, by the way, that I ignored here. So there's an alpha here. Um, would the gain, what would the gain be now? Higher, lower, much higher, much lower, the same. Well, think about the output resistance. The output resistance now looking here is RON, RON, right? This becomes beta RON, right? What does this become? No. Right? Not beta squared. Think about it. Where is that expression for the, well, it's actually here. Can we go back here? OK, so we are. And so what you see here, you remember? If, beta R, if RE is greater than beta RM, the limit is beta RO. So even if you make the RE infinity, this is not going to go above beta RO. So, So when we go back here, what happens is that we have, this is beta RON. So what is this going to be? Still beta RON. Same thing here. So this is going to become beta ROP. Well, this is going to be ROP. This is beta ROP. But this is still going to be beta ROP. That's, like I said, you remember back a few minutes ago, I said, uh, you don't see triple cascodes that much in bipolars because you gain nothing. You actually lo lost an alpha. If you, I mean, that doesn't really matter. But just like if you want to be really doing ac ac accurate accounting, you lost an alpha. You didn't gain anything. So that's why you see double cascodes. But also remember, this is because of the beta. We saw that that expression behaves differently for MOSFETs. And when we talk about MOSFETs, we'll see that in MOSFETs, you can actually get an aggregation. So in MOSFETs, you do see double or triple cascodes because of this. Right? But you can see that we can increase the gain substantially in one state. And we'll see how these things will start looking when you add stuff. So you don't want to do really triple cascode, right? I mean, four bipolars. So that's it. Any questions? No? All right. Very good.